Well, thank you, Dr. Jip. It really is a pri privilege and a pleasure to be here. I, I confess being a bit nervous. I mean, it's my alma mater, and I wasn't sure how I would feel uh, walking on the campus. And um, I think I'm, I'm, I probably will cry a little bit later. Um, yeah, it is nice to be here. The Waybright Center wasn't here when I was a student here. Neither was uh, President Waybright, but that's okay. <laughs> but, um, but yes, I'm coming as a, a pastor scholar, a pastor with, who's had academic sensibilities for a long time and by God's grace was able to do the, the doctorate and um, had a chance to teach for many years, often as an adjunct, but then um, full time. But I, won't, I'm, I am gonna weave in a few personal anecdotes and I hope you don't mind as I get into this topic. You know, years ago when I was a younger pastor, I attended a denominational conference and went out to lunch with a friend. And this friend was always, um, he always would cut up and he, he's, he's still pretty comedic, at least he thinks of himself as such. And um, he, uh, when we would leave the, 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 the site of the conference, he would snatch off my name tag, you know, and I was gonna take it off anyway, but he'd snatch it off so we could, you know, kind of be inca incognito as we were going out for lunch. And when, he, he was chatty this time as we were in a restaurant, and, um, and the uh, server and he, you know, they were interacting, and at some point, some attendees from the conference came in, and she uh, got a little crestfallen, and they had their name tags on, <laughs> and she, she knew that there was this church group in town, and she was not all that excited about serving the Christians because she knew she wouldn't get tipped well. Now, in my own experiences, it had me wondering if Christians were bad tippers, so I decided when I was working on that first Peter commentary to do just a little bit of research, and some people from my alma mater, Cornell University, they had researched tipping, and they discovered this. It says, results indicated that Jews and those with no religion tipped more than Christians and members of other religions, but the vast majority of Christians tipped at or above the normative 15% of bill size. That's when 15% was nominal. A normative, and that sounds like the Christians I knew and kind of do exactly what you had to do and not much more. So Christians might not be poor tippers, but we aren't as generous as others according to that study. Yet Christians had this reputation for being stingy in some circles. So if I ask you right now to think of a metaphor for the church, and sometimes when I'm talking to church groups, I'll ask them to respond out loud, but I don't want to take that much time right now. But for the most part, I get these beautiful metaphors like family and community and bride, words that we see in scripture or we imagine such. In earlier days, I would ask, and you'd hear army. I think that one's coming back up again. But anyway, for the most part, we Christians have a favorable view of ourselves, and maybe that view is aspirational, if not actualized. But, but many people in the USA do not share our favorable view of ourselves. A few years ago, a Christianity Today article argued um, that, uh, or started out with this line, evangelicals are the only religious group in the United States that has not developed a better reputation over the past few years. And Americans have become less likely to know an evangelical, more so than any other faith tradition. I found that interesting, especially people who have the evangel, the good news, would like to be known, and they said statistically, less likely to be known. Another study went on to say only 21% of non-Christian people have a positive perception of the local church, a fifth. Half of non-Christian Americans don't trust local pastors. When I started out as a pastor, we had a little bit more trust than that, I think. And I suspect we could say that Christians have a negative reputation in the world because we do so much good that people are simply jealous. I mean, after all, some people hated Jesus, so they will naturally hate us. Maybe there's some truth to that, but at the same time, it seemed the Lord hoped that we would be agents of positive change in the world while winning people over to the Lord. We would not be purposefully alienating people, but instead be extraordinarily loving, kind, compassionate, and self-sacrificial. As God's peculiar people, as Peter would put it, we would be shining lights in darkness. We would be salt and light. Christianity in the USA and perhaps throughout the world can have a stronger witness, more fruitful influence, an increasingly more Christ-like reputation if we recover what humility is meant to be. Humility is not a self-help strategy, although some might see it that way. 
And even though Jesus says that whoever wants to be great must be your servant, humility is not meant to be a stepping stone to some worldly sort of greatness. Humility is actually countercultural. So my discussion of humility and power today has three main movements or themes. Humility as a Christian identity marker, excuse me, <clears throat> humility and the power of marginalized people, and humility and shepherding. My first point is that humility should be a Christian identity marker. A German scholar, Eve Marie Becker, says that in, earliest, in early Christianity, humility was regarded as a virtue that was unknown in the pagan world and thus as a Christian identity marker. And Becker goes as far to say that the Apostle Paul invented humility. I mean, he appears to be the first in the ancient world to give positive meaning to tape na frasune. We'll talk about that word a little bit later. What is humility? I'm defining it this way. Humility is a way of life rooted in submission to God and is demonstrated in actions that foster mutuality rather than competition. So I see humility as fundamentally a biblical virtue because it starts out with us yielding to God and it moves us to be peacemakers. Humility is not popular, at least not in the U.S. and not even among Christians. We tend to think of humility as weakness and passivity. I mean, that's often people's first kind of image of what humility means. You know, it's sort of like if I show up in a space, and I'm a pretty even-tempered sort of a person, at least I think most people who know me would say that. So if I talk about things like race and, and class and power, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, and I'll say it in a way that, you know, is acceptable to them, then, oh, he must be humble. Like, the bar is just don't be a jerk. I think that that's not the bar, you know? <laughs> But we do often think of humility as, as passivity and weakness. Jane Fulcher, she writes, while humility had a central place in early Christian theology and practice, it has generally been marginalized by the modern Western world and in contemporary Christian life. She's one of several authors who note that Scottish philosopher David Hume dismissed humility as a monkish virtue. German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche referred to humility as Christian slave morality that demonized the pursuit of power and self-fulfillment. There's also a stream within Christianity that distorts humility by equating it with humiliation and smallness. Humility does not mean viewing ourselves as insignificant or as some lowly, wiggly worms. It doesn't require us to think that we're junk. No, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, all of us, and to protect um, um, I'm sorry, excuse me. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, and all of humanity being made in the image of God does not need to denigrate itself and call that humility. But while we don't engage in the self-denigration, neither do we behave arrogantly or vaingloriously. Vainglorious, that's not a word we throw around much, but it's that old King James word from Kenodoxia, empty glory, vainglory. Um, Rebecca Conan Dyke de Young, she wrote a book about vainglory and says the prideful desire superiority and the vainglorious desire the show of superiority, although these can easily be entangled in practice. I'm saying that humility rejects the pursuit of superiority, real or imagined. So it would be good at some point, maybe not right now because we just don't have the time, but to imagine what it might look like for increasing numbers of Christians to actually practice humility. What things would come to mind? Vulnerability, better listening, more empathy, more respect for the weak and marginalized. I mean, surely humility can't mean pointing fingers and doubling down on self-righteousness, snark, and arrogance. In other words, it can't look like much of what I see on Christian Twitter X. So let's keep in mind the possibilities that humility invites when we think about ministry in our schools, in our churches, and in other spaces, if humility can be a Christian identity marker, then I hope it can be a way of life and not something we turn on and turn off depending upon the situation. So that brings me to another point. I'm trying to argue that humility is not meant to be episodic, but is meant to be a way of life. To protect our psyches, as well as our bodies, we do develop a version of humility, I think, in which we don't yield very much ground to others, but we don't want to be called arrogant. 
So what I'm saying, maybe rather than trying to either absolve ourselves of pride or present a glittering image of success to the world, we would do better to reject society's hierarchical competitive culture and examine why we feel the need for any self-promotion. Embracing humility does not begin with worries about how impressed people are with me. I don't need to measure or calculate my humility as if I'm being graded on some sort of scale. We don't need to prove how humble we are. It's not really a contest. Humility grows from my relationship with God and governs how I interact with other people. So cultivating humility means pursuing intimacy with God and compassionately serving others without worrying about my brand or stressing over my popularity. Before I shift to my second main theme, I want to note part of the reason why I say humility starts as intimacy with God. I want to briefly consider the example of Moses found in Numbers 12, 1 through 16. I did want to read it. I think I can do that. If it looks like I'm going to take too long to read passages, I'll skip them because I know y'all have it memorized. <laughs> Most of the Bible, right? Anyway, uh, uh, Numbers 12. While they were at Hazarot, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had indeed married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, hear my words. When there are prophets among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak, with, I speak face to face, clearly, not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud went away from over the tent, Miriam's skin had become diseased, as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam and saw that she was diseased. Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us for a sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like one stillborn whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of its mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord saying, oh God, please heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam had been brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Well, I won't go through the whole passage, although I did want you to see the story in context, but it's that verse 3 that stands out, right? It's sort of squeezed in there about Moses' humility. And uh, commentators typically interpret the, the uh, representation of Moses as humble or lowly or gentle as referring primarily to meekness in relationship with others. In fact, one scholar it goes as far as to assert that Numbers 12.3 is a counter to, as he puts it, an accusation of arrogance on Moses' part made in verse 2. Yet Miriam and Aaron never actually accuse Moses of arrogance, at least not that we see explicitly. We only get details of their complaint directed toward God about how God speaks through Moses, who just married an African woman. Now, the Numbers 12 context pictures Miriam and Aaron as complaining about Moses' role as God's spokesperson. The two, two other scholars, they, they notice the nature of Miriam's complaint, and they point out, the thing being questioned by Aaron and Miriam is Moses' status, not his ego. And I found their argument convincing. It appears that the lowliness or the humility of Moses describes his connection to God more than his interpersonal connection with his siblings or even the rest of the people of Israel. Intimacy with God shows up as submission to God. And in the Numbers 11 and 12 context, what marks Moses as humble seems to be the way he's intimate with God. I mean, that, that uh, phrase that God says he speaks to him face to face or literally mouth to mouth. Humility starts as submission to God. <clears throat> Excuse me, then it moves out to make an impact on others, to make a positive impact on others. 
It's like what Aquinas writes, but humility considered as a special virtue regards chiefly the subjection of man to God for whose sake he humbles himself by subjecting himself to others. As I transition to the notion of humility and the power of marginalized people, I want to note how the refrain of Proverbs 3.34 paints a picture of humility as a way of life. The refrain gets repeated or echoed in the Apocrypha, the New Testament, later in the Apostolic Fathers. He mocks, this is the NIV version, he mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. Sirach then, for example, picks up this notion and says it this way, my child, perform your tasks with humility. Then you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the greater you are, the more you must humble yourself, so you will find favor in the sight of the Lord. Then later, in the New Testament, but God gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then also, and all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Then later, in 1 Clement, let our children receive the instruction that is in Christ. Let them learn how strong humility is. I actually love that phrase, how strong humility is. Before God, what pure love is able to accomplish before God, how the fear of him is good and great and saves all those who live in it in holiness with a pure mind. Boldness and arrogance and audacity are for those who are cursed by God, but graciousness and humility and gentleness are with those who are blessed by God. Humility, like love, is a pervasive theme throughout the scripture, the Apocrypha, the New Testament, later Christian writings, because it's such a critical aspect of our faith. Look, Christianity in the United States is a polarized mess right now, and I believe that humility could help us get back on track. When I think about this concept, I think about some adults in my life. I think about my own father, even. And uh, when we were at this church I, we attended when I was a kid, um, I'm going to say a little bit more about that church later, but we were in church all day. Some of you are not used to this, but I'm old, and this is how it used to be. So we'd be in Sunday school for an hour and a half, morning worship for about three hours, afternoon service for a couple of hours, then the evening service was also well, whenever people felt like going home. So that would be at least a couple of hours. And um, we, would, we would get there for the afternoon evening services um, on early, which was really on time, but we were there before everybody else. So my, we would sit in the car often waiting for the doors to be open. And only deacons could have keys, but my father got a key because he was always there on time, so they trusted him to have a key. But I think about how my father served in that church and, and how he was helpful, how he would stay around to see if anybody needed a ride home who had come on, the, on public transportation, and, um, and how he just would assist in different ways. And my father was a very bright man, but without much formal education. He had to leave college to go fight in World War II and, um, and then took care of his mother, brilliant person when it came to mathematics. You know, setting up and assisting in those kind of ways might seem like an insignificant matter, but humility is reflected in the way that leaders interact and serve others. So over several decades, I've been in a lot of ministry, I've been in doing, you know, church planting where we meet in non-traditional spaces, and over the years, I, with this kind of mental image of my father, I would find myself grabbing a broom, folding chairs, wrapping up the cords, and driving people home, because I actually wanted to simply embody humility and not see it as a, a strategy to gain somebody's favor. Well, I've been trying to touch on the notion of humility as a Christian identity marker, but I'm transitioning to talk about humility and the power of marginalized people, because this it affects the way we do our education as well. When I was a student at Cornell, this is now many years ago, I started attending an African-American church near downtown Ithaca, and um, one day I'm coming back to campus, or coming back to my dorm room actually, and uh, walking, working my way up north campus and <clears throat> going through the student union. And I look and I see a person in uh, custodial garb buffing the floors and recognized him as this prominent deacon in our church in the city. And I thought, wow, I didn't know he even worked up here. And I thought about all the ways that we students, many of us African-American students who attended, looked up to him, a very vocal person, a leader in the church, just a, you know, gave off this very godly image. But then I thought about all the students with the power and privilege who go to an Ivy League school, walking right past the custodian because, you know, we don't notice those people. 
And my point is, humility allows us to learn that lessons of godliness come from those most likely to be overlooked. This relates to what I wrote about in Might from the Margins. My thesis was based on 1 Corinthians chapter 1 there. I'm not going to read the passage for the sake of time, but like I said, y'all got that memorized too. But it's about how God takes what's apparently lowly in the world to shame the wise. I think that our ability to embrace humility as a way of life is largely related to how willing we are to accept that God often comes to us in the unimpressive. And we can receive lessons from the unimpressive, whoever or whatever that might be, when we have submitted ourselves to God. So let me try to say this more clearly. The lowly of the world are often our best teachers of faithfulness and Christlikeness. And the more I submit or yield to God, the more I am able to learn from those who are on the margins of society. That's part of what humility entails. The places where I received my formal Christian education accepted the Christian faith of white people of European descent, that's the standard. The faith of marginalized people was respected only to the degree to which it affirms white superiority. But what picture of Christianity is most like that of Christ? I've got a couple of block quotes for you. These I actually will read. The first is from Professor Albert Rabateau. He says, African-American Christianity has continuously confronted the nation with troubling questions about American exceptionalism. Perhaps the most troubling was this. If Christ came as the suffering servant, who resembled him more, the master or the slave? Suffering slave Christianity stood as a prophetic condemnation of America's obsession with power, status, and possessions. African-American Christians perceived in American exceptionalism a dangerous tendency to turn the nation into an idol and Christianity into a clan religion. Divine election brings not preeminence, elevation, and glory, but as black Christians know all too well, humiliation, suffering, and rejection. Chosenness, as reflected in the life of Jesus, led to a cross. The lives of his disciples have been signed with that cross. To be chosen in this perspective means joining company not with the powerful and the rich, but with those who suffer, the outcasts, the poor, and the despised. Professor Rabateau's observations are not unlike those of Frederick Douglass that you hear from time to time. He says, what I have said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference, so wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, woman-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Now, Douglas could see that the Christianity practiced by so many in America was not the way of Jesus described in the scriptures. Yet, I dare say that for many Christians today, and I think often in evangelical circles, the great American heroes of the faith are people who justified slavery, who owned slaves themselves, and who weren't always sure what to make of the souls of black folks. Did we have souls? Could we be saved? Some of the theological giants weren't even sure. Now I'm saying that marginalized Christians are the disinherited and possess unique power to demonstrate the way of Christ. And I take that word disinherited from the poet, mystic, and theologian Howard Thurman. You may know his book, uh, Jesus and the Disinherited, a classic, written all the way back in 1949 and still relevant. And, Sir, and Thurman centers in his words those whose backs are against the wall. That's his term for what I'm calling marginalized believers. Here's more of what he wrote in context. The solution which Jesus found for himself and for Israel as they faced the hostility of the Greco-Roman world becomes the word and the work of redemption for all the cast down people in every generation and in every age. The basic fact is that Christianity as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker appears as a technique of survival for the oppressed. That it became through the intervening years a religion of the powerful and dominant, used sometimes as an instrument of oppression, must not tempt us into believing that it was thus in the mind and life of Jesus. We leaders could miss out on some of what it means to be a follower of Jesus when we fail to learn from the people who tend to get overlooked. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that 
in a few minutes. I'm going to take us quickly to just a picture of, of what some of this might, some implications for this, at least when we see in the New Testament. I'm, I'm in Paul territory, so I'm very nervous, Dr. Jim, because so, this is not, it's not, my, not my specialty. But I'm thinking about Philippians, right? And, and the way we're set up for, for Philippians is by looking at what Luke says, right? And so in chapter 16 there, and you may be familiar with the, that Macedonian call, come over and help us, and Paul shifts the mission, and they go on over to Macedonia. And Luke says they stop in Philippi, and he describes it as a leading city. Protas, he says, it's a first city, a leading city, and a colony of Rome. So we're set up to know that there's these special privileges and how important it is. Some commentators who write about the letter, they seem to, they acknowledge that the letter seems to, at least to some degree, interact with imperial sensibilities, such as Paul's mention of the praetorium, him touching on the notion of citizenship with these rare verbs, polytuistai in 127, polytuma in 320. He, he, he talks about this bending the knee and hailing Jesus as kurias, like the way people would do with Caesar, how members of Caesar's household even send greetings at the end. So there's some you know, Romanesque things in that letter, of course. And then Euodia and Suntuke, two women that he addresses in chapter four, likely the names of enslaved people. So what I'm imagining here is a community of free and enslaved people who are coming together because of Jesus. And then to have Paul say, and in, in what he writes, I'm not going to read all of it, but that line, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Now, depending on where you are in this social hierarchy, that's good news, because I've been working and literally slaving to help this powerful person, but that powerful person has to look at me in a whole new way. That's what I'm asking for. I mean, it, I mean it's, it's what our friend Michael Gorman, a New Testament scholar, would say is Paul's master story there because he shifts right in, in verse 5, right? Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, and then we get the beautiful uh, Christ him. It's like Galatians 3.28, where the hierarchical distinctions don't seem to matter in Christ. When I was a kid... I told you about the little church I attended. Felt like I had to work for my salvation in that church. I'm not here to dump on any denomination, but they had a oneness theology. You had to be baptized to be a, a Christian. And you had to have certain experiences that would mark you as a Christian. Um, and I'm a kid, you know, I was an athlete. I played sports and I'm a musician. I'm, and, um, but I also was kind of bookish. I liked science and math. and. Um, so I had this very rational image of what was supposed to happen in the church, and it wasn't happening, and somehow I wasn't fitting in. And the message I was getting is that you gotta get your act together for God to save you. So I had to sort of prove something to God. And then at that same time, because I was born not that long after the Brown versus Board of Education decision to desegregate schools, I was bused to a white neighborhood in Queens, New York. I'm from New York. And um, every New Yorker is going to tell you at some point that they're from New York. And, um, and, and you know, Douglaston is the neighborhood where John McEnroe wrote a tennis great practice. He practiced at the Douglaston Country Club. My neighborhood didn't have a country club, just so you know. So I had, you know, black friends, black kids rode on the school bus. And then I'm at a school with white kids. I'm in these two different worlds, which I didn't even think of as a kid. Didn't, didn't know how to analyze. I just knew that we kids on the bus were always seen as the discipline problems and that we weren't going to do as well in class. I think my teachers were generally shocked that I did well in school. And then by the time I got here, years later, I, um, <laughs> I had some difficult interchanges, and I was wrestling with myself like how much to talk about it, but I'm going to mention one of them. I remember being in a class and responding to a, uh, a question from the professor, and, um, and his response back to me, he put on this like mock, um, patois of somebody from the South with no education, like you might imagine a black person in a, you know, in a 1930s movie talking. And he looked like, blah, 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 blah. I'm not even going to say what he said. So I'm sitting there saying, what the heck? I'm like, I'm, I'm from New York. I don't talk like this. But why would you even feel like you could do this? 
and why isn't it bothering anybody else, you know, which is also what was going on. Um, that agitated me, and uh, when I went to go get my midterm exam, he curtly said, I don't, have your, I don't have your exam. He said, I gave him back. I happened to work security at the time, so when I was on my shift, I said, I know what happened. He put it in the wrong box. Those boxes were in, uh, in Rolfing down, I don't know if there's, I'm not Rolfing, in uh, Olson. I mean, uh, they're probably still down there. Anyway, so not my test, because I found that. I went, I went in there, found my test in somebody else's mailbox, which is exactly what I thought. And I had a really high grade, like 98 or something. So I said, that has to be a good grade. So I saw him later, and he said, genuinely shocked. You got the highest grade in the class. Like, it really seemed to bother him that, that I was doing well. And don't get me started on a few other professors, but I'm not going to drop them. I, I was praying about this. Like, I don't know how much I'm going to talk about. But, but, a, but a different professor <laughs> who gave me a really hard time when I asked questions from my African-American perspective, especially in an ethics class, he didn't want to talk about it, put me on the spot in the classroom, and then you know, proceeded to win the Faculty of the Year Award at the end. And I said, OK, that's, that's telling me a lot of stuff here. You know, when I passed my oral defense years later, <laughs> and the dean comes in to congratulate you, you know that warm feeling when you, some, some of you here who have PhDs, you know that. It's just this emotion comes over you. They call you doctor for the first time, and I'm in tears. And the dean says, oh, you're the first African American to earn the PhD in biblical studies here. And I'm saying, and I remember thinking, first? I'm still at that place where I've been the first or the only so much of my life, often in Christian circles, but not only. And I'm telling you all this to say that all along my journey, I needed to know that God loved me, because early on the church didn't make that clear. The theological world around me didn't always treat me as if God loved me. And I could tell you way too many stories about how evangelicalism has caused pain for people of color. That's for another time. But I do sometimes lament the way I was treated and the irony that now that I'm over 60, I get invited to be part of boards, committees, and conferences. Thanks be to God, I live long enough for some people to actually want to hear something I have to say. When George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, a city where I served as a pastor for a while, a lot of black Christians, including me, were asked to give interviews, and suddenly white people wanted to hear from us, only some of us, and only for a time. And since Esau Macaulay can't be everywhere all at once, Sometimes, sometimes we OGs get a call. <laughs> so, I got one last point to make. It's about humility and shepherding. So I'm telling you a lot of my background to say how, for me, when I think about theological education, I am thinking about my own story, but, I, but not just my story, my story in a biblical context. I left to go plant a church in Brooklyn, New York, and, uh, and uh, that's a whole nother story. Um, but during the time, I didn't, there was no money, so I went to, I had to teach school again, so I was teaching math and chemistry. We now euphemistically call this being bivocational. Back then, I just called it hustling to make a living. So, <laughs> but the headmaster at the school acknowledged that I had a flock. That was the way he put it, that I had a flock at the school. And I kind of like that, because I do see teaching as shepherding. I think of leading as shepherding. So I want to remind us all of Scripture's call for humility but also kind of connected to this notion of leading and teaching. In June of 68, Servius Sulpicius Galba became emperor of Rome after the death of Nero, and uh, it didn't really go well for him. He managed to frustrate, alienate, and infuriate soldiers as well as political leaders. According to Suetonius, Galba was cruel and greedy, and a lot of things he did I'm not, I don't have time to elaborate on. He didn't have any children, so he selected an heir that nobody liked, particularly not the soldiers, and, um, and then he reneged on a promise to give bonus pay to the troops. So having alienated the military, Gaba was doomed. And then on the morning of January 15th, now notice he becomes emperor in June. Here it's January, just seven months later. He and his successor enter the forum and were attacked by soldiers who hacked him to pieces and decapitated his successor. Josephus briefly recounts Galba's reign as well as his death. And he, noted, he notes that the soldiers took Galba to be, and here's this word that we mentioned earlier, tapenafrasune. That's the word that Paul uses for humility. Peter uses it as well. Josephus, however, uses it in the sense of small-minded. Some translations will say pusillanimous, timid, lacking resolve. Josephus' use of that word compared to that of Paul and Peter 
reflect this generally negative connotation of the concept in the Greco-Roman world. New Testament scholar Reinhard Feldmeier, observing the way that both Josephus and uh, Epictetus employed tapenafrasune, concludes, it has a negative meaning that lies, depending on the context, somewhere between sycophancy and pusillanimity, servility and shabbiness. But ironically, and I think it is ironic, Peter and Paul both reinterpret the word here for us, so they redefine it in some ways to describe what, for what Josephus used it for a pitiful leader, they use for somebody who's um, actually more of an ideal leader. That instead of small-mindedness, weakness, and timidity, we embrace a notion of self-sacrifice, gentleness, and fearless advocacy on behalf of the vulnerable. So rather than tapena frasune describing insecurities and weaknesses, it describes humility necessary for guiding people on the path of shalom or wholeness. I was going to spend some time talking about this first Peter passage. I won't. I'll just say briefly a few things, and then I'll start to wrap up here. I like the passage a lot um, in that first Peter 5, 1 through 6, because it hits at a lot of things born from my experience as well as my own relationship, well, my relationship with God, my experience as a pastor, and things that I study. Um, Peter says this. I will read a little bit. Now as an elder myself and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight not under compulsion but willingly as God would have you do it, not for sordid gain but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you who are younger must be subject to the elders, and all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. There's much in there that's rich to me, and I go back to that passage quite a bit. But I think the, the thing I want to center on is that notion of being an example to the flock. Because teaching isn't just about information. And you all know this, especially those who are teaching. <laughs> it's also about inspiration and maybe some emulation. <laughs> there's, there's who we are and not just what we know. And in some ways, Peter is saying that. And I think you know, we can't help but to see in this no matter who you think wrote First Peter, I'm not going down that road right now, <laughs> but, but you can't help but to think of the epilogue to John's gospel, and, and, and I think there's, it's intentional to see this um, uh, so-called restoration of Peter and what Jesus says for him to do. What does he say? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And here's Peter now, an old man. He says, I'm an old man myself, and I'm telling you, protect the flock, watch over them, Episc episcopos. Right, to, to, to be the, the one who watches over and, and set an example. Leadership is shepherding. And in that shepherding, it fosters a collaboration, not a hierarchy. I'll end up with some reflections from theologian Willie James Jennings in his powerful book, After Whiteness and Education and Belonging. He discusses an essay by Belgian theologian Edward Skelebeeks, and it's entitled Secular Criticism of Christian Obedience and the Christian Reaction to that Criticism. Skelebeeks um, sought to reconcile a vision of humanity's grandeur and the biblical notion of humility. So Jennings comments, reconciling the magnanimous man and the Christian man, reconciling inherent human grandeur and godly humility was a dilemma for Christianity. So Jennings goes on from there to argue that Western Christianity created a concept of what an educated person should look like. And he says this, white self-sufficient masculinity is the quintessential image of an educated person, an image deeply embedded in the collective psyche of Western education and theological education, flexible enough to capture and persuade any and all persons so formed to yield to it. It floats through our curricular imaginations, our pedagogical practice, and the eco ecologies of our academic institutions. Jennings says that our theological formation that serves this image of white self-sufficient masculinity will, quote, lock students in a formation that will take much more than it will give. 
I feel like I can not only appreciate that, I, I actually can feel it. <laughs> I think a path forward for us is this path of humility. Because I believe all of us who teach, who preach, and otherwise guide people should take humility seriously. So I'm arguing that if we promote humility as a Christian identity marker, I dare say that there may be many other things that people think of when they hear the word Christian, but I'm saying that humility should be one of the first things that comes to mind. And I, and I know that some people feel like that scholars are especially guilty of not exhibiting humility. That's anecdotal, but it's worth thinking about. Humility is a Christian identity marker and enables all of us to respect the spiritual power of those marginalized by worldly power. I mentioned, I lived in DC. I know how people like to be around those with power, but they want to be near the politicians and they ignore the people who clean the floors, work the elevators, open the doors, serve them food, and otherwise work in the shadows. Many of those people are African-American people who attend the black churches in DC, but are, be, are invisible to the people who are striving to be important. Humility also marks us as shepherds. It guides us in the formative work we do as Christian leaders. And we leaders model collaboration rather than competition. All right, I got, okay, I'm wrapping up. When I was heading to school here back in the 80s, the school advertised with this tagline, come study with the men who wrote the books. And the picture was a stack of books written by white men, and perhaps that relates to what Jennings was getting at. I will say, however, that Ted seems to have come a long way, and I recall when Bruce Fields was voted in as the first full-time African-American faculty member. It was the year I graduated from here. I don't know the African-American Bible or theology professors you've had in the 35 years since that time, but the day that Bruce got voted in, I ran into Scott McKnight. I was doing my rounds in security, <laughs> and I said to him, I heard we have our first black faculty member, full-time faculty member. And without skipping a beat, Scott said, Dennis, you'll be next. I was encouraged, but I didn't believe him. And um, you know, I remember thinking, you know, maybe TEDS could grow its own um, black biblical scholars. That was the language I was using, grow its own. Now, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but I went to the president at the time, who was not Dr. Waybright, and I went to him and I said, I wonder if we could grow our own black um, professors. And I said, I, I, I'm kind of thinking I'd like to do the PhD. Do you think there's any way I could get money to, to do that? And he said, well, you got to get in first. I'm like, okay. So I applied, I got in, and then I got the letter that said I had to pay a $200 deposit. And I said, shoot, I don't have $200. So I called him back and I said, I'm about to make this step. I said, do you think I could get some kind of scholarship to help me? He said, I wish I could have recorded that conversation because nobody's going to believe me. I've told this story for like 35 years, only to a certain few people though. Um, and he said, I don't think black people want to come all the way out here to the suburbs to study. So no. I was like, dude. So I started a PhD program at Fordham in the Bronx while I was still in New York. And then I moved to DC and started all over again at the Catholic University of America. And I got on the alumni board. So while I was on the alumni board, I come out to campus a few times. And by then, Dr. Waybright was president and he was talking about some of the things. We met, I think it was Dr. Hunter at the time was dean. And we talked about some things. And um, they always give a report to the alumni board. And at some point, Dr. Waybright says, you know, our African-American students would love to see more black faculty. He said, maybe we should grow our own. I'm like, grow our own. <laughs> I, was, I mean, it was years after. I said, hmm. But I do want to say, you know, the journey has been a little tough. There were times when, you know, I got mistaken for the hotel help at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature, wearing my tie and my name tag, but people assumed I worked for the hotel. I guessed why they assumed. But I do want to end by simply honoring some of the folks who saw me while I was here and helped me not to give up. One is the late Jim Spear. He had his quirks and, and challenges, but he saw me. And I was his graduate assistant or TA, whatever we called it back then. The late Bruce Fields, who did encourage me to keep on going and to do that PhD. The late Grant Osborne, who I would choke up in tears thinking about how encouraging he was to me. And then Scott McKnight, who's still alive, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and Scott's the one who's, who opened the door for me to get some things published and to help people to know that I actually exist. My friends, just remember this. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. God bless you. Thanks. <laughs>
Dr. Edwards, thank you so much um, for that lecture. We now are going to have the chance to continue the conversation. So a couple announcements as we sort of change over the stage here before that. Um, the first is that I just want to remind you all, our next event uh, will be not next month, but in April. Uh, on April 25th, we're going to have Walter Kim, uh, who's the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Um, he will be here giving a lecture on loving God and a catechesis of civic discipleship. Um, so we do hope that you can join us for that. It will be again Thursday at 11 a.m. on April 25th. Um, I also want to remind you, as Dr. Jip said, that we do have some of Dr. Edwards's books over here for sale. So after we have this conversation now, please do grab one. Um, it's cheaper than it is on Amazon over there. So uh, please do pick one up if you're able. I would highly commend this book to you. Um, at this time, we're going to have some time for Q&A and um, a, a brief response. Um, I'm pleased to welcome, to lead us in this time, uh, Bing Ni, who's a pastor at Holy Trinity Church, or sorry, Christ Church in uh, Hyde Park, where he's been for some time. He also is a TEDS grad. I think he has three degrees from TEDS, so uh, a friend of this institution, and we're grateful for his ministry down in Hyde Park. He works a lot at the University of Chicago, actually is one of their religious advisors on campus and does a lot of campus ministry there. So I'm gonna invite Bing uh, to the stage and also Dr. Edwards back forth so that uh, Bing can offer a response and then we'll have time for questions for all of us. So please welcome them back to the stage with me. It's a joy to be back at TED's. Uh, thank you for uh, spending your time with us. Dr. Edwards, thank you for your work in this area. Um, it's a, both a, a probing and, and piercing assessment, um, which we need to hear. And thank you for your transparency, vulnerability, that remind us that the seminary experience for the student um, has the possibility to impact for good and ill. Uh, it leaves impressions upon us uh, that for you have lasted over 35 years. Yeah. And um, it's a reminder to us as academicians, professors, teachers, pastors, that it's not only the content that's valuable, but the character from where that content comes from. And uh, may we take that to heart uh, well, in preparing for our time, I, I, uh, I just went to Amazon and typed in humility, books on humility. And uh, what may surprise you is, it may not be surprising that much, but there's very little written from the academic standpoint. And if there is, it's usually uh, studying historical uses of humility in, in uh, societies long gone. Uh, but there is quite a bit of, uh, not quite a bit, there is material that largely comes from the religious vantage point, yeah. uh, Catholic, Protestant alike. And um, it certainly shouldn't surprise us that the majority of these writers are, are religious. Um, and though it may be an overlooked subject, um, it, it's, it's an overlooked subject outside the church because it's undesirable, unprofitable, and at times, undefinable, right? We, we all know, how, how do you define humility? Uh, maybe after a conversation you and I have with an individual, you might be able to identify that person. That person's, you know, humble. And we certainly know or can feel when someone's not. Uh, and it's, 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 it's something to, to put our... It's hard to put our finger on, but we certainly experience it. And you've given us three great purchase, perches whereby we ought to view humility. It marks us as believers. Uh, it is often demonstrated or can, be, can uh, be demonstrated from those who are from the margin or overlooked. It's a quality shepherds, pastors, teachers, professors um, must have. Uh, Jesus is the pinnacle of humi humility, that in his one, or seldomly he describes himself autobiographically, but in that one 
Uh, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And Philippians 2, Paul reasserts it. It's demonstrated in uh, the cross on our behalf. Uh, he was overlooked because what good could come out of Nazareth, right? It's, it's, uh, but uh, it's similar today because what good comes out of Englewood? Yeah. What good yeah. comes out of you know, West Garfield Park? Yeah. Yeah. What good comes out of Woodlawn or Roseland? Yeah. You know, and, wow. and I think uh, I'll get to that in a little bit because that's the context in which I serve. He was overlooked. Um, and he is our good shepherd. And thank you for those three things because Jesus embodies those three. But as many of you know, the Henry Center's commitment is to bridge the academy with the church. And I've been tasked to consider how your words may inform my work in pastoral ministry. So this first question is self serving. <laughs> um, and uh, every church's mission is informed by the context in which they are situated in. I serve at Christ Church Chicago, which formerly sits in the Woodlawn neighborhood of, on the south side of the city. It is the gateway to the, the richness of African American cultural life. Uh, we, the average household income is just about 31K. Uh, just shy of the, natu the national poverty line of a family of four of 30K. We are within one, a one block walk to 2,000 undergraduates at the University of Chicago. Uh, their dormitories, two blocks from its prestigious law school. The estimated undergraduate tuition and cost of living at that university in two, 2023 was about 84K which according to some websites, ranked it to be the most expensive school in the nation. Wow. And so here we are in my context, in my congregation, I have students, not all of them are, are paying that whole bill, but average spending 84K a year with congregants that from the neighborhood that they're, if they're part of the average, they make about 30K a year. and. We're in, uh, I've been called to shepherd in a congregation like this, in this context. Um, people who will go into positions of great power and influence, attorneys, physicians, venture capitalists, professors. Uh, in our congregation are also those who uh, fall victim to the misuse of power. Uh, Certainly in a community where there's um, displacement, um, divestment. Um, yet it's one of, it has been in my, I don't know, 16 years of pastoral experience, the most enriching mm. place to serve. Okay. And people go, Bing, why did you move to the south side? It's... Uh, why do you stay there with your family of four? And um, it's because I believe the gospel serves both the ivory tower mm. and the street corner yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And yeah. I got to figure this out. Yeah. And uh, two years in, I was about to give up. <laughs> um, but another shout out to someone in this room. And Dr. Cha, I, I don't think I've ever told this to you, so I'll tell this to you publicly. But when um, long ago I was, I was, I was like, how do you minister to this, this black and white divide, this educational divide, this PhD, GED divide? And you said something probably in passing, and it, it's been my source of encouragement and strength. And you just simply said, being everybody needs the gospel. <laughs> and, um, and I said, that's true. Yeah, amen. It's indiscriminate. Yeah. Everybody yeah. needs the gospel. But um, all that to say, this leads me to my first question. Our congregation, probably like many, experiences fracturing, division, whether we label it classism or disunity or segmented, whatever you call it. Um, what role does humility play 
in bridging the divide and bringing unity while holding uh, racial differences, um, uh, economic differences, certainly generational, young and old, educational differences. What, what role does humility play in that? Oh. Wow, that's rich. I am, um, well first, uh, Pastor Bang, I wanna say, you know, God bless you for the work that you're doing. I mean, I think that that's, um, it's really commendable, and I do think that the, the answer to my question is gonna be really about you too, <laughs> because I think, um, I mean, I'm partly a little bit envious, and I confess that because when we went to plant a church in New York, that's, that was our dream, to have those worlds come together and not, not just collide, but come together and form something new. But our church plant didn't take off, and, um, and, but to hear that there's those kinds of, of congregations existing warms my heart. But I would say a lot does come back to you because you know, I'm thinking about Philippi and you know, my quick overview of Philippi. You've got powerful and relatively powerless people there. And I, and I know, you know enslaved people in that society in a different kind of um, um, way it happened in the United States, but there was still this hierarchy, right? And, um, and, there, and, a, and a, the ball is really in the court, with that metaphor, for the powerful people to exercise the humility to see those who, are, uh, who have been and are being marginalized. But I come back to the leader because I do think the way you serve will be ultimately um, the way that question gets answered. Because if you are, and this is not to say anything, I, don't even, I only met you last night, so I don't know how you minister, but I, I feel like you would take very seriously that I'm not gonna play favorites in this congregation. But I do know of pastors who would say, well, they're giving a lot of money. I gotta spend more time over there. And the folks, and I've seen churches that let people walk out the door who didn't have much money, but go chase down those people that did, like one really find out why, why they might be disinterested in leaving. I mean, I've, I've had that experience of, uh, of my board wanting to go after the wealthy people who were mad at me and <laughs> make sure that they don't leave. But the folks who didn't seem to have much to give, they were ready to let them go. That kind of leadership says something to people. So your willingness to say, I'm not gonna play favorites. Those, those rich, well-educated people don't necessarily get any more of my love and attention than anybody else, I think is actually part of the answer to the question. Because I could easily say, oh, those folks gotta give up something. But I don't wanna start with the those folks. I wanna start with the me, right? And I think as a leader, I'm gonna set a tone for that. So. No, that's, that's good, that's good. Um, there are two open mics on each side of the room, and uh, as I position my second question, feel free to find your way to one of those open mics. Um, you've been really candid and vulnerable and honest with us. Um, you're 60, which I wouldn't have guessed. I would, Thank I, you. I have guessed. <laughs> I'm a little over 60, but okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Dr. Edwards, given your role, mm -hmm. your platform now, uh, your influence, mm -hmm. your power. Um, mm -hmm. How are you using your power and yeah. in, in being mindful of, of students you serve and yeah. neighbors you have. Yeah. You know, I, I think about that because I, it is relative. You know, I, there's still a president in the university even though I'm the seminary dean. But, so I still, <laughs> and because seminaries are struggling, well, you guys are doing great compared to undergrad. For us, it's the opposite. Our undergrad is doing well, the seminary is like, we're just holding, we're holding our own. And, and uh, you so can send them this way. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you to go to send them this way. <laughs> but in all, in all seriousness, I think it is, it's, it, there's always this hierarchy that you're ne negotiating and navigating. So it is a rel but you're right, it's a relative power and privilege that I have compared to some other places I've been in and other folks. And, and for me, it's still a matter of me being, um, trying to be true to what I just was talking about. In other words, the, the folks with the titles don't necessarily get any more of my love and devotion and care than anybody else. And it, that's sometimes a little infuriating, so I don't know how long I'm gonna be in this role because it's a little infuriating to the people who have power, you know, who, who, who figure I'm supposed to drop everything to respond to them when I think, well, 
part of my task is, yes, I've got to, I've got to navigate you know, a variety of relationships, but if the students and folks who don't have much feel like this is in place for them, then we've lost the real goal here, right? And um, so for me, it's a matter of making sure that that, doing what I can, I can't make sure of anything, but to do the best I can to communicate that, um, that, I am, that our school is here for you, and that you is often the student, mm. right? And primarily, I would say the student. So yeah, I, I try to bring my voice. Um, before I took the call, I wasn't sure I'd be a dean. I, I was, didn't pursue this at all, but when, when the door opened, I consulted a bunch of friends, and I had this very moving experience. I won't share the whole details of it because there's no time, but, but I talked to my spiritual director and said, well, how, do you, how, would, how would you know that God wants you to take this? Like, what do you need to hear to know this? Like, what do you need to hear? And I said, well, I feel like I'm trying to represent the folks on the margins when I get to that, that table of power. And I said, I guess I want somebody on the margins to say, Dennis, you should be in that seat. Mm. The very next day, I was at the prison where we, do a, we have a program in Stateville, Correctional Center, and I'm talking to one of the brothers there, and he just kind of intuited that I was going to be in the running for the dean position. I'm like, how did you? He said, I figured, he said, I figured they're going to come to you for to be dean, and I said, well, they have, and he said, you need to do it, and I said, why? I, I, said, I said, you know, there's a lot of work there. I don't want to be a token. I gave him all these excuses. I was Moses right then. I would give him all the reasons why not to do it, and he said, you know, you talk about the margins. He said, Dennis, he said, we're not even on the margins. He said, nobody even sees us. He said, we're in prison. We're out in the hinterlands, he said. Mm. He said, but here you are standing here right next to me talking to me. He said, we want your voice at that table. And I, I started to cry. And I walked away from that thing saying, oh, my goodness. The very thing I asked for the day before is showing up right here. Um, somebody who, is, who doesn't have that voice is saying, Dennis, you can be this voice. So I said yes to the, to the job. So for me, that is my job, right? So anyway, thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, we'll go ahead and, and take the question here. If you don't mind just introducing yourself so we, we know at least your name. And, yeah, uh, my name is uh, Henry. Uh, I work here at Trinity and did the MDiv degree here. Um, for a couple of years, I served as a pastor at a white evangelical church. Now I live in Chicago. I attend a church that's more multicultural. And I, I guess my question is, maybe kind of similar to yours, but I kind of feel like multi-ethnic ministry doesn't work um, in the American context, especially in evangelical spaces. And like, I guess I was just wondering like, in what ways has a lack of humility or pride poisoned multi-ethnic ministry in the American evangelical context? And like, how can we move forward in such a way because a lot of times people of color in a way they have to give up their culture to be in these spaces mm -hmm. or assimilate on some level. So there's still this hierarchy um, that's at play in these spaces. And I feel like a part of me is just like, I just want to go back to a black church right now. Cause I'm like, yeah. and I haven't been able to articulate why, but I do think the pride of it and the lack of humility um, is a, is maybe a key factor in that. Um, oh, brother Henry. Um it's going to take me a longer time to answer that question than I want to, but I will answer it. But if you get my number and email, let's have another conversation about this, because this is, this, is, this is right where I live. Yeah. And um, the quick answer is, you're exactly right. I mean, it, it's a lack of humility on the part of white folks. So there's a, there's a powerful book that was written a few years ago by someone else named Edwards, who's not related to me, but Dr. Corey Edwards wrote a book, right, The Elusive Dream, you might have heard about it. And, she, and her argument is that, inter, she was using the language interracial, interracial churches are only interracial to the extent that white people let it be. Because frankly, if, if something gets a little too ethnic or too black for them, they'll leave. And then, so it's cha changes the dynamic. So they exert a power, even if their numbers aren't in, in the majority, they still exert a power. And, and, and this, was, this was my story. We, I left a church that hurt me tremendously in Washington, D.C., predominantly white church, and I served on their staff. And, and I, I tell some of that story in my From the Margins. I won't get into it all now. But, but um, when I left the Planner Church, a lot of the white folks that were blessed by my ministry wanted to come to her church. And I said, well, I'm not going to go to a black neighborhood and plant a church with you know, 100 white people. I said, let's, let's be a little bit more deliberate about saying this church is for our neighbors and for our community. 
and we had to negotiate some things. But the, but the short version, and I address it in the humility book a little bit, is that it, it definitely, if we're going to say, have anything that we say and it's going to be multi-ethnic or multicultural, whatever the language that we're using, multi-ethnic we use in the Evangelical Covenant Church, um, humility is going to have to be in place. But, it's, but then we go back to the Philippi example. It's going to be the people in power, relative power, who are realizing they, they can't keep holding on to this status that is not some God-given status. It's one that's been taken by power. I mean, worldly power. And, and that's got to be reckoned with at some point, right? So I, I could give a much longer answer, but the short version is you're right, that humility will help us to get to, that, to get to some healing in that place. And I think that our inability to practice it, and I'm saying we in a very generous sense of that we, to practice it makes it really hard for, for what we say we want in multi-ethnic. But I'm, I'm not the expert. You got an expert here, <laughs> Dr. Chai is the expert. But, but I will say from my experience, that's what, that's what um, you, you, you hit all the right issues. Now, I'm saying this as a man over his 60s. You're a youngin, and, mm -hmm. and you're facing the same thing I faced. That says something about how our actions didn't match up to our rhetoric over the years. So I'm, I'll just leave that out there for now. Mm -hmm. I think this might. Uh, Doctor, I'm Bill Betts. I'm in the Educational Studies program here. Um, Howard Thurman, early in the book, Jesus and Disinherited, talks about a conversation with a Hindu president hmm. when he was touring India. And he gave this very articulate understanding of the black experience in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he said, How can you be a Christian? Yeah. And he said, Over these years, I've deliberated, meditated, reflected, and this book is my answer. Strikes me that you have a variation on that theme, but maybe within the evangelical world. And I'm just wondering, I'm, uh, what comes to mind is humility and courage, humility and commitment and covenant. How is it that after some of these experiences, you have maintained this, I want to say, uh, determination to continue working within, to some degree, mm -hmm. to speak truth to power, to power and all that. But it strikes me that it's related to humility, but more that advocacy piece, but advocacy towards the world that it would have been much easier for you to leave. Oh, well, you read me like a book. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I consider it quite an honor that you would see my work kind of related to Thurman's because that's exactly what I was thinking in both books that I was, these two recent ones. Um, I don't know the easy answer to that question because I gave up back in around 2001, I gave up on evangelicalism. I said, man, I was so mad. And I said to my wife, shoot me if I ever work for white evangelicals again. <laughs> I mean, I was just, and, uh, and I was, I mean, I, I gave away, I mean, I just stopped everything that was white evangelical. I mean, I stopped Christianity Today, I stopped all, I was like, I don't have anything to do with it. And at the time, there were these rising stars who are people now who are probably like in their 50s and 60s that I didn't know who they are. And when people were dropping names of people like, you know, 20 years later, like they've been around for a while, like, I don't even know who these people are because I wasn't following, you know, the stuff. But I now don't say that I work for white evangelicals. I say I work, I'll work with them. But if I can't be myself, I'm, I'm gone. I'm gone. And, uh, but, I, but you said the word determination. I think that actually was what it is. I think there was some kind of stubbornness in me. No, that sounds negative. No, I, think, I think of determination, that's a more positive way to put it. I think there was something pushing me to say, um, do what you can do and say what you can say. And I'm also like a pragmatist. Like, if somebody's gonna pay me for a job, I'll take it, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, I mean I've, I've, I've been poor. And I've struggled quite a bit. And I got to the place where I said, well, I do need a job. But at the same time, I want to be you know, who I am. Uh, that's a convoluted answer. But I, do think, <laughs> but I do think determination is the right word. But I am not unaware of the, of the di dynamics that you articulated. So I do, I'm much less naive than I was when I was in my 30s. So thank you. Dr. Edwards, yeah, thank you. Uh, first, the first thing I have is just a, a comment. It's not a question. I mean, you're one of those people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing your experience here at TEDS. Yeah. Just because, you know, as an alumni of TEDS as well, I, I appreciate that you're helping us have 
a more truthful view of our story as an institution. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, the question I have is, um, I'm really appreciating how you're talking about humility and especially as an exercise for those who are in power. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts too about what does the exercise of humility look like for those on the margins so that it's still a liberative oh, uh, it, practice. Thank you, Pastor Juliet. I, I, I really appreciate that. You know, when I started the book, I was, that was the question that was in my head the whole time. And I said, do I put this now first or last? But I decided to put it last. And I call that chapter empowering because I honestly think, okay, it's going to sound too hokey and evangelical to just give a Bible verse, but <laughs> I do believe that verse I left you with. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, in that case, okay, there's an invitation to, to be the humble person, right? So Peter says, therefore, humble yourself. But for those who have been humiliated, there is a power that we've achieved by virtue of our experience and the determination and the faith and the fortitude that that I think now gives us a particular um, strength that is not um, um, necessarily evident in, you know, to the eye. It's, it's an it's a inner, deeper kind of a strength. Um, now that's, that's oversimplifying everything I say in that chapter, but the, the point I'm really trying to make is that we do have a power, and what I'm calling for in Might from the Margins is for us to kind of have a solidarity of the marginalized and use our voices together because by ourselves it might not be strong enough to, to get through some of the noise. But I do think that we, do, we have a spiritual power that God has given us by virtue of our experiences and the reality that we've been marginalized. So I see that power though as a godly power. I don't see it as one that we take. In fact, I would say if we think that that power means becoming like our oppressors, then we're on the wrong track, right? So it's a different kind of a power that we're gonna demonstrate and, and, and that we actually possess. So um, I didn't fully answer the question, but I, I wanna like, push toward that though, that there's a spiritual power that God gives by virtue of our experience and our, our faith. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> Brother yes. Jeff. Um, as an institution that wants to inculcate humility and produce pastors and yeah. ministers and people with that particular sensibility, yeah. even, no matter where they end up, and in your role as a dean now of, yeah. of a seminary, how do we as an institution begin to inculcate that sensibility, that humility yeah. as intrinsic to the pastoral role, the ministerial role, um, you know, no matter where you go? What are some ways at least yeah. you see forward for an institution like TES or like North Park where we're we're trying to intentionally train people right. to have this kind of sensibility. Yeah, thank you, Brother Jeff. Got a big shout out to Jeff. He, he helped me in my, Greek, my first Greek exegesis class at North Park. He came in and TA'd for me and worked with students, so good to see you. Um, um, how questions are a little tricky for me because they're often contextual, right? So, um, but I will say this, that the thing, it's almost like what I was saying to Pastor Bing, is that the thing that we model will rub off on students. You know, now, I wasn't trying to put much shade on TEDs, but I did want to share my experiences, because I know the 80s were seen as like this heyday of, of TEDs, where it was strong and, you know, this juggernaut in evangelical education. But there were a lot of us that were unseen, and many of us that slipped away, you know, who just realized it didn't fit them, and they left. And I know some of those people, you know, left. It was a hard time, because I didn't feel like the community um, as a whole um, was excited for me to be here. It was like, okay, you know. <laughs> but, I, so I named some professors at the end who, and I used the word intentionally, who saw me. So I think there's something about us as faculty members that, you know, this is, but this is every age, right? You remember grade school teachers who saw you. You remember, you know, high school teachers who bothered to know you. It's the same thing here. And, and it's not just um, the person who's uh, getting the straight A's. It's, it, it's, it's whomever, you know, God has opened up these doors to, ha to have. So for me, it's worth it when a student says, you know, can I get a few minutes with you? Can I get coffee with you or whatever like that, right? So I think it would have communicated a lot to me if I had a few more people who cared who I was and that there was actually a real story to even get me here, you know, to, that, that, to, to be able to matriculate. So I don't know. I mean, I don't want to 
say that there's a whole lot more work to do. I know professors are working hard. I know administrators work hard. I mean, it's a hard landscape right now. It's hard to get students into the schools and keep them in. I know it's hard. I mean, I know it really now. But I'm also saying that rather than trying to add another program or something, I'm saying the way we carry ourselves can be an, a welcoming way or it can be a, you know, a standoffish way. And, and, and I felt a lot of the standoffishness when I was here, but not from everybody. So I never want to say that. Well, the mics are empty. But we got 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I take 10 minutes? <laughs> right. I got time. But uh, oh, we don't have to have everybody Dr. stay Cha. around. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Chaz. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, Dr. Edwards, for sharing your thoughts with us. As I'm thinking about, I mean, as uh, Brother Jeff mentioned, we as a seminary want to live out the yeah. Christian value of humility, amen. particularly in training future pastors. Yeah, but we're also academic institution That's right. that often likes to express ourselves as an elite, elite sure. institution of learning. Sure. And this is where competition with other peer institutions coming to a picture, yeah. where the language like we are the Harvard of a Christian liberal arts colleges or Harvard of this and that, that kind of rhetorics could easily spill in to institutional life, especially when things are becoming more competitive. We want yeah. to enroll more students into our sure. program. So even though that's not at all in our mission statement or even our stated core values, uh, this striving for elite status becomes an unspoken value at many institutions, including like ours, and that has many unintended consequences. So yeah. now serving as a dean, <laughs> how do you bring this biblical value of humility into institutional life yeah. so that it might shape the mind and hearts of faculty, staff, and students? Yeah, that, that, I mean, it's, in my hearing this, it's a little bit of a version of Jeff's question, but takes it up a notch in some ways. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, Dr. Cha. I mean, I don't want to assume that I have all the answers there, but I will say this, we're wrestling with it at North Park because we have you know, gone through a whole kind of discussion about our values and things recently, of course, with me coming on as dean. And we've named things like humility and our prophetic witness as things that mark us, right? So, so for us, you know, we're just embracing it. But we're also figuring it out right now. So. People are reading my book and we're talking about it. In fact, the trustee meetings start this afternoon, so I got to get back for trustee meetings that'll go till Saturday. And uh, the president of the university wants all the trustees to read my book, you know, so we can wrestle with this question more holistically, right? What, is, what does it look like? I, I think, I, I don't believe that our striving for excellence in our work is, is counter to cultivating humility. I don't think, I don't think that. But, it can sometimes feel that way, right? I mean, or it can sound that way, like being humble means I don't care as much or I don't try as hard or something like that. Um, so I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know really, I, I'm waffling a little bit because I've, I think there's a space to say we are excellent at, our, at what we're trying to do here. And the humility comes, as I'm trying to define it, in our submission to God to, who drives us in our work and my love for my neighbor. I mean, as simple as that sounds. So I don't know how the messaging comes across to others, but I think the reality is when we, it's like, you know, yeah, it was like what I said with the, you know, come study with the men who wrote the books. I mean, that can come off as really pretty arrogant, you know, and, um, and I think it did. I think is why some people stopped. But for others, I was having a coffee, a coffee with somebody at SBL and I was talking about that and they said, but that's great. And I said, yeah, I guess from his perspective, he was a young white guy, that was really what he wanted and I said, so I guess it could come off for some people like, that's not an arrogant statement at all. That's exactly what I want. I want to study with the men who wrote the books. And, um, and it was the men who wrote the books, just to be clear. So, and, um, so I, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't, I don't want that. So I, it maybe just comes to a question of what, what do we really want? Yeah. So, if, anyway, thank you. That was a good question. <laughs> can, I, can I share how it's played out good. as a pastor? So I came to TED's, started my MDiv in 07. 
But in these days where maybe in our settings where it's hyper-polarized, there's a lot of infighting, mm -hmm. I realized what Ted's gave to me was intellectual humility. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't, um, the free church generally is more open theologically. And, you know, I took with Dr. Fields, liberation theology, mm. which people are like, why would you take that at an evangelical seminary? Now, if you go to, to the divinity school at the University of Chicago, that's like, you have to, that's, they, they don't require any bi biblical theology, but you, you know, and, and I realized it's helped me immensely uh, in the sense that I'm far more charitable from knowing that this is not Oh, it, it, there are theologies out there to consider, and um, it's helped me enter into conversations with people who are now deconstructing or reevaluating or reassessing. Uh, and I can hear that because it's not just the singular uh, train of thought maybe other institutions have where this is the way, the only way, you believe this, everything else is out of bounds. And, and my education at TED's, um, you guys never told us the right answers as professors. I think that's, uh, you know, what, what view of eschatology should I have? You know, here's the eight and you <laughs> go pick one. Um, but I realize that's been an immense benefit, um, pastoring at least where I am, that I, I don't have the, it's not a singular answer you're looking for. And it, it, it fosters this intellectual humility that I just don't know. But I think there are at least three things you should consider. Um, so. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, thank you. Thank you all. It really you. has been a pleasure to be here. Um, I haven't been in the Waybright Center before. It's a beautiful space. And thank you so much for graciously receiving me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Edwards, uh, may your vision not die. May <laughs> Ted's actually produce black theologians in-house. Mm. And um, mm. <laughs> may we all live to see it. Yeah, God bless <laughs> so, you. Um, do I pray? <laughs> Do I pray? <laughs> Father, we give you thanks yes, Lord. for men and women that you gift to the church from all places, all spaces, all walks of life that are encouragements to, to, to so many of us all. Thank you for Dr. Edwards and uh, um, his time with us this, this morning and afternoon. We pray that... Um, we, as an institution, as uh, the church, would embody humility, that we would be gentle and lowly in heart, that we would be shepherds that uh, live out humility, that it would be the bold witness to the watching world, that the people of God are humble. And as we humble ourselves, Lord, would we receive your favor, would we receive your blessing, would we receive your might uh, to um, love you well and to serve others diligently for your namesake. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.